It's our pleasure to welcome you to this webinar today. This is part of the Crisis Coach webinar series presented by Firestorm and the Rochester Business Alliance. We're pleased to have the Rochester... Contingency planners, Bill. That, okay, you forgot to tell me that. I'm sorry. Eastern... Okay. Very good. Well, nonetheless, welcome to the webinar. As I mentioned, this is Firestorm, and we invite you to become our friend at, at uh, Facebook, Firestorm Solutions. You can also follow us on Twitter, Firestorm Soul. And there is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value. Firestorm empowers you to manage risk and crises. The expertise of Firestorm is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communication, crisis public relations, and consequence management. Please keep in mind that this presentation is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. The work product provided by Firestorm must be read in conjunction with your organization's personal counsel. And this information should not be made considered legal advice or legal opinion. We're delighted to have the Rochester Business Mind and the East Great Lakes. What is that again, Jim? The e Eglap? It's on the screen. Bill, Bill, we teach reading now, I think. Oh, we, Eastern we Great Lakes that. chapter of the Association of Reconstruction. I can see that now. What yeah, a, it, we, we hit it right in front of you. Uh -oh. and by the way, it's fun to everyone to know that these broadcasts are live, <laughs> and you can see uh, how live they are at some times. But both organizations and coming together, and uh, we appreciate both of them and what you do in western New York as, as to carry those areas. Uh, and help us. And I know that you've got some cold weather, and we were just talking with Chip, and it's going down into minus numbers, and uh, anytime you're in the minus numbers, it's tough. So, Chip, any insights you want to share with us today? Absolutely, Jim. I'll start by saying, you know, John Stewart's leaving the Daily Show, so if uh, Bill wants to, <laughs> to uh, uh, audition for that, I'm sure we'd be happy to have him. Uh, and, and I understand there's an opening on NBC, too. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Absolutely. Well, good morning uh, to our listeners and uh, to all of you on, on this cold and uh, soon to be very snowy Rochester day. Uh, welcome to the second in the 2015 series of The Crisis Coach. The Rochester Business Alliance is, of course, delighted to partner with Firestorm, which we've been doing now for about a year and a half, and our friends at the Eastern Great Lakes Association of Contingency Planners to bring you, our members, this critical 45-minute discussion by Jim Satterfield, who is, as you've joined us before, know uh, as one of the country's top crisis managers. And uh, Jim's always busy because we always have crises. All we've got to do is watch the news. And he's going to be covering the second of three sessions on building an intelligence network. Today's session is about anonymous reporting. Well, I Googled anonymous reporting as I was preparing my welcome for today's session, and I got 112 million hits. Yep. 112 million. In a country where you can research your neighbor in an instant and look at anyone on the street as a potential terrorist, it seems that everyone wants a secret method to sound an alarm. It also seems that it be, has become very easy to blow the whistle on anyone you may not like. I readily admit to watching morale drop at my old workplace when employment went from 36,000 to about 2,000 over 30 years and manager after manager got caught up in the outfall of anonymous reporting by people who were angry at the company and the people executing the downsizing. To top it off, uh, just this past weekend I read Harlan Cobain's mystery that focused on the ruined lives of four people subjected to internet rumors by a vindictive former college roommate. As I see it, any reporting system must have checks to protect the innocent. That's why I'm eager to hear what Jim has to say today about how, how anonymous reporting is used rather than abused. It's all yours, Jim. Well, thanks, Chip. We appreciate your insights, and I uh, like the way that you uh, always tie everything together so nicely as we focus on it. I think we all are facing a struggle with uh, understanding how we can identify our next crisis and what's coming forward in it. And there's an upside and a downside with anything that we're going to be talking about. And so today we're going to talk about some of the things that haven't worked and point you to a direction that hopefully will work as we think about creating an intelligence network. 
So can you identify your organization's next crisis? And the words there say we can. Uh, more importantly, you can, and that's really where we want to be talking about what could be out there. And there are a lot of things that could happen. Uh, we tend to focus on workplace violence, but it could easily be brand and reputation issues that are that start to come forward. And how they're dealt with makes a difference. Uh, as we were kidding a little at the intro here today, and I was giving Bill a hard time, and that's always a fun thing to do uh, at this point. Uh, Brian Williams at NBC and the Nightly News. It was the uh, he had a story from his experience there, and uh, initially it was told correctly, and then over the years it evolved where the uh, event happened to his uh, helicopter as opposed to the one in front, and on and on. And reports came back to suddenly say this is not right, and that had a significant impact. Obviously, as you see the six-month uh, furlough without pay, you see the other applications. But if those anonymous reports had come in and had been wrong, it could have damaged a brand and reputation, and it would have been a devastating one. So being even-handed here and, and understanding what's going on becomes extremely critical. And when we think about creating an intelligence network, it's really the only way to know what it is that you don't know. And we uh, have a lot of different elements in creating a, an intelligence network. It could be background checks, and it's not only the background checks what you do initially when you hire the person, but it's annually because some things will start to come up, and that's a key indicator. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of an insight into some social media aspects of monitoring, but we're seeing that as a key element to find out what's being said on social media. Having a a program to, to deal with the behaviors of concern. Once something uh, comes in, uh, what are you going to do associated with that? Uh, how do you know if this person really has a behavior of concern or not within those elements? So our goal is to know today what's going to happen tomorrow. And as always, Firestorm follows a predict, plan, perform uh, process. And it, it will help you to transform that uncertainty into certainty. And so our goal is to know uh, what's going on. And to know, you must listen and look. And you probably have heard us talk about in some of our other webinars, dividing listening and looking into two different elements. The listening is more of a situational awareness. It's a broader aspect that's uh, going on within it. If we're focused on social media, for example, to do listening, we're looking at streams phrases and words. But once we hear something, then we need to look at it. And that's a much more focused one. And it's a targeted awareness. And in the coming webinars, we're going to be talking more about uh, the fact that social media is not random. It's targeted. And that's an element that I think most of us haven't fully appreciated as we go forward. But then we can look at a specific person or a specific location or a specific event. We can establish a sphere of influence and in who that person is involved with. And it's a way to put all of these things in context. And so chip into the uh, situation that you referred to earlier where uh, some people got thrown under the bus within your former company, having a plan to be able to look at this in its entirety, a uniformed approach, really is a key element in making sure that uh, someone has, isn't being falsely accused or uh, that the right person who needs help gets that help when they need it. So we talked about uh, this intelligence network. And here's the framework that I just described, the background checks, the anonymous reporting, the behavioral risk threat assessment, and the social media monitoring. Uh, the little definition there of crisis, I think, is very helpful as we think about it. And, leads us into this discussion today on anonymous reporting. It's a risk event for which one has not identified the vulnerabilities and exposures, has not developed a plan, and therefore does not know how to respond. Uh, I often kid that the last time a surprise was good, I was five and it was my birthday. And I think that a surprise in business or academics is uh, in the education marketplace clearly has the same level of impact and, and concern that we need to be associated with it. Now, we have one factor here that's a statistic that we'll share again later in the, our discussion today, but I want to bring it up up front. When they've looked at the uh, 
workplace violence scenarios, the armed intruders, uh, those types of events, they found that 80% of the time someone else besides uh, the person with the uh, intent to do harm knew about it. And even broader, that two-thirds of the time, two or more people knew about it. Well, when people know about something, they talk about that, and that's where the, lead, the term leakage comes in and that information becomes available. So within your organization, you want to make it as easy as possible to find out what people are talking about and let them bring that information forward. All too often, we'll see quotes like the one here. I knew when it happened, that was that's probably who it was, that and the person's name has been removed, referring to a formal, former pupil. I would have been shocked if it wasn't. Well, if this person knew that this person had a potential uh, tendency toward violence, why didn't that person come forward? Why didn't the teacher come forward and say, you know, this I'm concerned about this child in this area? Now, we're going to talk about businesses today and not education, and, and the education market certainly has a challenge in a variety of areas. But there's a probability in your company that there are people that pose a risk or a threat. Someone else is aware. Someone else knows. Someone else has an opinion. You want to create an environment that it's going to be safe <clears throat> for them to come forward and share that information, that there won't be a backlash. You told me this and it was wrong, or, or that they're going to be called out in front and said, oh, well, that's the person who said this. Um, and again, the other aspects of it start to unfold. Let's look at where anonymous reporting is right now in some of the channels that are out there. And we'll talk about some of the things that are working well and some of the things that are not working well. And then what you have to do in your company to create a culture so that when someone knows something, they'll come forward. Well, we have all are familiar with 911. And we're very fortunate in America that we have first responders that will run toward the emergency, run toward the event, uh, the police, the fire, the medical. Uh, responders. And clearly, one of the things we want to make sure that we communicate in all of our organizations that if you see something that you feel poses an imminent threat, there is, you call 911 first. You don't wait to call a, a tip line or a hotline, or you don't wait to tell anyone else. You pick up the phone and call so that help is on the way to you. Now, Firestorm is a fairly large employer of retired Secret Service and FBI agents. And um, our friends at the Secret Service always share a statement, and that statement is that when seconds really matter, the police will be there in minutes. And so that's why you have to have plans and procedures in place to buy yourself time until help can arrive. Uh, the shelter in place, the evacuation, the lockdown, the lockout, all the, the standard protocols that are included in those areas. But one element of anonymous reporting is clearly 911. It's the one that's been around the longest. It comes in. We see strengths and weaknesses there. There's recently been difficulty uh, across the country in 911 centers with identifying uh, where the person is when they call. Cell phones have presented a difficulty. And particularly when you look at county lines and a person who's just barely over the line into one county, it may go to a cell tower outside of the county, and that delays the response. We've had a a uh, very tragic death here in the Atlanta area in just the last few weeks where a lady ran off the road into a lake and she was calling and the 911 center could not locate her. And they did find her later, but unfortunately by that time it was too late. So 911 serves a purpose and it's certainly a key beginning point. Now, the federal government through the Homeland Security has started the If You See Something, Say Something program. We've heard this. Uh, uh, for years and years, and it's been widely promoted uh, through the, this uh, across the country. But yet, we don't. We have people who have seen things and not reported it. We uh, had a picture that we've shared in some of the uh, webinars that we've done about a student in a classroom with a gun, and 34 other students in that classroom saw that, and yet none of them reported it. So there's some confusion about what uh, would happen in these areas and how that coordination has been. And so it's a nice thing to say, but in practice, it's just not coming forward. Could be distrust in the government. 
uh, could be a part of the reason. But there's a beginning here that I would direct you to look at over to the right. You would need to be able to share who or what you saw, when you saw it, where it occurred, and why it's suspicious. And sharing that information. And again, you see just below that the reinforcement of calling 911. So I think because of the uncertainty and what's going to happen and I don't want to get involved and uh, what will happen to me if we would carry that forward, that becomes a concern for us. And uh, I think that the when we look at the percentage of people that call in an event when they've seen it, you'll find that it is extremely small. And so anonymous reporting isn't the only tool that you should be using in creating your intelligence network within your organization. It is a tool. It is not the only tool. And it's the combination of the social media monitoring, the intelligence network that's created from that, the background checks, identifying the behaviors of concern, and we'll talk about those warning signs in just a minute again. But anonymous reporting plays a role. In the education market, uh, there are individual uh, programs like Safe to Tell. Safe to Tell is a, is a good program. It's in Colorado. It's geared toward public schools in the state of Colorado uh, after the Columbine events. And by the way, when you bring up the name Columbine, everybody associates that immediately with the, the shooting. It's also the state flower for Colorado, and that gets lost here. But uh, Safe to Tell, make a call, make a difference. You know, there's been some reluctance on students' parts. Uh, to call. Uh, the concept of snitching has a negative uh, feeling within them. And there's concerns about, is this really uh, an anonymous call? I direct your attention to right in the center of the screen where it says the word disclaimer. Should Safe to Tell become the victim of prank calls, the line will be forwarded and traced to, with a law enforcement notified immediately. Please use Safe to Tell wisely. Well, what that tells me is it's not anonymous. And so you, you really hype the fact that this is anonymous. You can go and you can report. But yet, if you do anything wrong, we're going to come and get you. Um, and so there's, a, there's an inherent tension within the relationship around the concept of anonymous. And I want to talk about that as we talk about creating a culture within your organization, however you choose to submit this. I will tell you that I think Safe to Tell is a great program. It has made a difference, and calls have come in and lives have been saved, and that's been a good reinforcement. Also from their website, you see a list of things of why someone would want to make a call. And this list is pretty good. I think it covers a wide range of those areas that would start to uh, come forward that you would want to know about that uh, as, as those events would happen. Now, I shared with you those two statistics in red down uh, at the bottom of the list. And that's the basis for having uh, an anonymous reporting system in place. But if you will look at some of the factors that are listed above, uh, the fact that they had a 60% had a feeling of being extremely depressed, 75 had hit suicidal thoughts, 75% thought they were bullied or threatened by others, those all are concepts around behaviors of concern. So having a behavior of concern program within your company so that everybody fully understands what those warning signs are will make a real difference. And then they have more of an opportunity to come forward and share that information. So that almost every disaster, every incident uh, of workplace violence, every act of terrorism was preceded by these warning signs. And so making sure that everyone is aware of them becomes very important. So I want you to take a, a step back for a moment and talk about what's your culture? What's your, the culture of your company? And when we think about culture, that's the beliefs, the attributes, the values that give your company its unique personality. And that's an important element. You know, our integrity, we deliver a quality product, we care about our people. All of those then become the types of attitudes and attributes that become extremely important. But your culture also defines the freedom in decision making, how people are treated, how information flows and powers and ideas and business dealings, and it doesn't change much over time. And in many cases, not all of this is written down. If you've got a, co a, at a company where there's an attitude that if you say something, you get attacked for saying it, well, 
we've got this other way, that's wrong, you don't know what you're talking about, you're sending a message that you don't want to hear. And you've got to create an environment that it's okay to talk and share what you see and what you know. And going back to the earlier slide where we used the term listen and look, you have to listen to what your people are telling you and they have to feel that it's safe for them to tell and share. So why is this broken down? Why is there the culture of communications within organizations broken down? First of all, it's top down. I'll tell you what you need to know. Uh, they don't have the tools. They speak and don't listen. There's been th frustrations throughout the organization. Well, don't go talk to them. They're not going to do what you need them to do. Uh, and it becomes apparent that people aren't buying into everything that you're talking about. So when you sit down and try to design an anonymous reporting system, if you're looking at the culture within your company, you have to figure out who we are as a company, what do we stand for, and design the program around that culture. So our ultimate goals here are to align any program to your culture. I don't care if you're designing a new sales campaign, if you're concerned about Six Sigma and continuous quality improvement, if you're trying to focus on safety and reduce the uh, number of injuries and lost work hours, or if you're creating an anonymous reporting program. It's got to align to your culture. Your culture. You've got to embed this as a sense of preparedness for everyone that's involved in the company. We always say at Firestorm because we find that every crisis is a human crisis. And your people need to know that you feel that they're important and in, that it's okay uh, to come forward and share information. So instead of communicating to people, what we want to do is to create a culture of communication. It has to be two-way. If it's only one way, it's not going to work. And that listen and look that we talked about became so very important. We've got to listen to what's being said. Then we have to look closely at that information. Chuch, uh, Chip warned us at the beginning today to be careful that some of these comments could come in that would be very hurtful. We have to have the confidentiality to study those and then to make an informed decision. So you've got to create this intelligence network within your organization because if you don't, you're not going to know today what's going to happen uh, tomorrow. So I would encourage you first to understand what exists today. What happens in our company when somebody knows something? How does this information flow from one person to another? We have to start at the very top where the culture uh, change is needed and make sure that everyone is around uh, from that aspect to respond as needed. We have to have our strategies and tactics have to be very simple. If I've got to fill out a six-page form to tell you something, I'm not going to do it. You know, we can go back to the even the simple uh, suggestion box. It could be a piece of paper with somebody dropping it in, or it could be a much more complex area. We can talk about how that might look in a few minutes. But you've got to then see if the culture is starting to change. And I would recommend that you go and you talk to your people. Uh, you do surveys. Uh, if you don't understand this culture, it's going to impact every other program within your organization. And that's an important element. And it starts from the very top of the organization. By the way, turnover uh, means that your culture will change. Some of the knowledge continuity issues are as important as the business continuity issues. Who are we as a company? What are our values? What do we stand for? How is that documented? And how is that communicated from one person to another? So can you really predict a crisis? The answer is undoubtedly yes. But you have to know what the warning signs are. And then there have to, with those warning signs, you need to know what the indicators uh, are that a crisis is starting to develop. And those indicators, they start to create patterns. And they, those patterns are identifiable and we can see they lead to the frequency, the number of times it happens, or the severity of how bad it really becomes. This is an important element. So as you're looking at that, we want to know what's going to be the trigger point. When do we need to intervene and take action? Uh, the value is identifying this, all of these things, these indicators pre-crisis, so that we can find the crisis before, in fact, it occurs. This is where we really need to focus our attention as we look at each of these areas. So awareness. Everyone in your organization must understand the warning signs of behaviors of concern. 
that needs to be a part of your culture. It's a part of the culture of preparedness. It's a part of the culture of the value proposition that you have and carry forward. And they need to understand that threats and statements of intent to cause harm are not acceptable and that they are not going to be tolerated within your organization. You, you don't provide training factors uh, to everyone. You're going to find that you're not going to learn and then you won't get the correct response. And then once those elements come in, then we have to focus specifically on dealing with the behaviors of concern. And we spent time last month talking about the behaviors of concern in a, a program called uh, BERTA, the Behavioral Risk Threat Assessment Area. But as you go through, we don't want to overreact, but equally we don't want to underreact as we go in place within it. So everyone needs to think that it's going to be safe to come forward and share this information. And you will then suddenly not just have your eyes and your ears to identify within your organization. You'll have everyone's eyes and ears. Now, we've talked about uh, intelligence, and communications is the most perishable form of that. Um, to know something that happened and was said last summer isn't going to do us much good as the weather goes into the minus degrees here in February. We need to act at the time when we know that. And so if it's going to be an intelligence, we have to be able to get the information quickly, analyze it, and then design a course of action. So this area is it doesn't have the luxury of waiting. So if you're going to think about an anonymous reporting program, that information has to be quickly validated, understood, and then actions have to be taken, or you will lose the advantage that that intelligence provides to you because it's very perishable. It's very time sensitive. Now, when we think about intelligence that comes in, it's soft data and hard data. Uh, soft data is the, what you see. It's your intuition. It's your experience uh, as you carry forward. Uh, it could be something you overheard and you're starting to, well, you know, that just didn't quite sound right to me. Hard data would be a copy of an email, uh, postings on social media, and uh, someone who's making a threat. Uh, just of an intent to take action. Now, in the hard data area, that's, we have an advantage there that we don't have with soft data. Uh, the hard data, we have technology that can help bring that to the forefront. And uh, we'll talk more and more uh, in the coming uh, webinar series about the need to monitor social media. If the statistics show that two or more people know, they're going to talk. When people know, they talk. And that talk is not happening around the water cooler as it did uh, early in my career. It's now talk, that talk is occurring on social media. That's been a change. And most of the leaders in our company, uh, in our companies across the country, aren't raised in that environment. But today's employees are raised in that environment, and that's where they go to talk. Now, being uh, having done work for a great many years. I can remember when you did talk around the water cooler uh, in an office or over a cup of coffee. And then we had a uh, fax machine so you could send information from one person to another. Remember the slick paper on the rolls and would send in a fax or a telephone call or a cell call. Uh, email started to become dominating and unfortunately email seems to be hanging out there and, and continuing to pump and fill inboxes across the country. So as we think about it, it, now it's shifted to text messaging. If you go out to dinner and you see a table with teenagers, and they'll be talking to each other but by using their thumbs and sending messages from one smartphone to another. And that information is out in the public domain unless it's behind in, in a uh, secured manner with uh, only admission of certain uh, people to it. But as that information gets shared, eventually it moves into the public area, and that's an opportunity for you to see what's going on. If you couple monitoring that aspect with what you learn through anonymous reporting and with what you observe, uh, then you start to develop an intelligence network that becomes actionable, that you can start to shape the actions and directions of where you want to go. 
Now, as you get this information, it needs to go into a secure repository so that you can take what Chip told us and what you saw and what someone else did, and you put it together and it creates a pattern and you go, I get it now. I understand what the problem is. And that central repository then has to be secure and confidential because we're not going to be sharing that across uh, with everyone. And if people don't have the certainty that they have the security of being anonymous, they're not going to come forward. HR is the perfect location to keep that central repository. So right now, you probably encourage your employees if they felt that they had been discriminated against or if they had been sexually harassed, that you go to HR and talk about it from that perspective. So this is an area that would directly involve the HR department within your organization to come forward and share within those aspects. So if you don't create this culture, if you're not focused on getting an intelligence network together, there's going to be things happening. And unfortunately, I will tell you, there are things already happening in your organization that you must begin to address. That's the critical nature of who we are and what we're doing. So let's go a little bit deeper on confidentiality assurance, because that seems to be the tipping point of when these programs work and when they don't work, because if there's any doubt, people aren't going to come forward. So we've got to have very clear anonymous reporting uh, procedures. This, we have to establish that it's OK if you see something to share that and that you're going to have it. There's a snitch mentality that part of your communications culture is going to have to address. You're going to need to explain to people that it's not snitching. It's you're here to protect the other uh, folks in our company, uh, the brand and reputation, because that impacts us all as those elements come together. A suggestion box is one way. There will be some people that want to just write it down on a piece of paper and uh, drop in a suggestions box. Uh, a confidential phone number, maybe it goes to an answering service or an answering machine. There is a fear here, though, that you're going to listen to their voice and you're going to know that you know, that was Bill who left that message there. And so we have to assure confidentiality around it. As you're designing an anonymous reporting program, uh, having the ability to have it come via text, uh, even an app that could be downloaded that could uh, give the option of coming in text or over the phone would be a clear way. Uh, placing a, uh, something on your website or having a website that someone could go there and post the information. If it's not easy, it's not going to happen. And so that becomes very, very important. There has to be uh, some surveillance detection. Uh, many of our companies have uh, video cameras and locations to see areas. but. It's the area that everyone needs to be aware of, of what actions are happening uh, in what area within it, as, as we would focus then on any behavior uh, that's out of place and out of norm. Tying back when an anonymous report comes in, then you could go on social media and take a look at what's been being said around that person and their sphere of influence. Uh, we are working with a Fortune 10 company, and we took one of their distribution centers, and we put a geofence up around that, and that's a, because we knew the location, and looked at all of the postings that were coming out of that particular company. In one eight-hour shift, there was an employee with 80 postings. I think this person must not have had a lot to do for them to be sending text messages and responding back and forth and making postings. And, Sure enough, one of those were stating that they were bored, that they didn't have enough to do. And as you read further on, it said uh, that uh, this person uh, was having a problem with a supervisor, that it was racial, and in one of the last posts in the day that he'd reached the decision that the only way that he was going to resolve this was by bringing a gun with him to work tomorrow. Well, the monitoring identified that, and so an intervention could take place. And, uh, if you knew an employee was going to bring a gun to work tomorrow because he was having a problem with his supervisor and there was going to be a confrontation, would you want to know that today? Or would you want to know it tomorrow when he's got the gun and is already in the work environment? Now, why are we talking about social media monitoring in the middle of a discussion about anonymous reporting? The reason we're having that conversation is 
all those people that saw those messages, none of them came forward. And some of those messages weren't shared just one-on-one. -on -one. They were shared with groups and multiple people who could be seen. So in going back to Chip's comment, there's a skepticism in the uh, need to come forward. Somebody else will do that. I wasn't the only person who saw it. We have to establish a culture within our organization that you have to uh, come forward. Now, as we put all of this together, there has to be control of, of who has access to the information and uh, has to have training around those areas, uh, visitor management and looking at the visitors on our properties, human resource policies and procedures. Uh, we've talked about already today that the background checks aren't just when they're hired. And by the way, a background check that focuses only on the uh, national crime database would show you only felonies. And so if someone had been accused of a felony but plea bargained it down to a misdemeanor, it would not appear in that database. So you have to look at down at the county level to find out what's going on. But if you were having an employee that was experiencing uh, a DUI arrest and it turned out to be a misdemeanor, that could be a substance abuse indication and wouldn't you want to know that? You have to have a trained and alert workforce. If we don't train our people, if we don't continually reinforce it, it's not going to happen. Say, see something, say something is there. And it's, it has to be who we are as a company because I've got your back, you've got my back in those areas that we come together. I would also encourage you to maintain relationships with the local law enforcement so that when you call or you have to follow up that there's an understanding here. You want to have relationships perhaps even with a psychologist because some of this behavior would warrant the aspect of understanding. And then I want you to test your plans. Any good business continuity program or any of the areas must be tested on a regular basis. Let's test the anonymous reporting and see if something is occurring if anyone comes forward. Let's, let's have something happen where, someone, where people are aware of it and then see if anyone comes forward. And if they don't, it tells you that you haven't created the culture that you're looking for. This is an unusual time of a test of a business continuity or a workplace violence program, but it is a test that unfortunately I feel that many of our companies will fail. So as you're thinking about all these elements, this is what comes together to create the culture that you're looking for so that it is a possible for you to learn what's going on within your company. So at the end of the day, do you really want to know what will happen tom tomorrow? If you don't, then you don't need to do an anonymous reporting program. You don't need to have an intelligence network. You don't need to do the monitoring of social media. But then if you answer that, no, I don't care, then I would ask you the second question, can you afford not to know? Uh, and unfortunately, you can't. And if you think that this is an isolated to the school environment, uh, our news is covered every day with stories of where this has occurred. Last year, you saw shootings at a FedEx location and a UPS. It's not limited to a single company or a single location. It points of tension around that, and as we're thinking about downsizing can easily be a trigger, as uh, Chip had shared earlier. Emotions run high, and if someone seems to be reacting in a strong way, you need to know that to make sure you structure that process in a much more advantageous. So I would encourage you, if you have an interest in this area, you can contact Firestorm to see how you're uh, to align your plans with best practices. You can create your own intelligence uh, network, and you can schedule some crisis coach training uh, as we go through each of those areas. So if you want to have an assessment of where your plans are relative to standards and best practices, uh, Firestorm can do that for you at no cost. That cost is underwritten by the Rochester Business Alliance or the Eastern Great Lakes Association of Contingency Planners, uh, as that is an opportunity to start to see where your plans are. It could apply to anonymous reporting just as well as your business continuity. My thanks go out to both organizations. And Chip, you raised some serious questions at the beginning of uh, our webinar today. Do you have any observations you want to say as we start to wind things up today? 
Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, one kind of overarching issue that uh, that occurs to me, and it, and it uh, really addresses so many things that go on within the organization, and that's the culture. Uh, and you've talked about the culture, and within that culture is trust. And as as everyone works to build a positive culture, a culture of trust, where you can talk to one another, you don't fear uh, what a supervisor is going to do or a manager is going to do because you understand that individual, you understand where the organization is coming from. Much of these issues that we've talked about today tend to go away uh, or are resolved fairly quickly because Un, you know, unlike having to go to uh, a reporting mechanism that may not get full information back to the people that have to take the action, if you trust people, you simply say, this is a problem, and you've got a lot better information, and you can work with it a lot faster. And I think that needs to be an objective as well for, for all of our listeners to really look at the culture of the organization. I, you're 100% on target as always, Joe, and I appreciate your insights and direction and support that you give um, to everyone who's on our webinar today and the directions that we're going. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot of things that happen every day in the workplace that go unreported, and that allows the situation to continue to escalate to where there's no choice but in the mind of the, the, the individual that violence is the solution. Violence is never the solution, and that's why anonymous reporting becomes such a critical element in what we're talking about. If you have questions, you can reach out to us at firestorm.com or contact us at webinars at firestorm.com or give us a call at 800-321-2219. Uh, we uh, have had some folks on the call today. We haven't taken questions from each one of you but I'm going to ask someone, uh, one of the first form principals, to reach out to everyone on today's call to answer questions and see where we can help. So, Chip, thank you again. Bill, thanks for uh, handling uh, the moderating and uh, making sure the webinar ran perfectly today. And uh, we'll talk to everyone next month as we continue this discussion around uh, how do you know what you don't know, creating an intelligence network. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And stay warm, Chip. Absolutely, Jim. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye.